I'd like to dedicate this talk to the memory of Charlie Portman, who probably did more or as much as anybody to make Orion a success. The third anniversary of his death is in a few weeks' time. Now, uh, what I plan to uh, do this evening is whiz through these topics. I'll talk about, for a couple of minutes, the context, what Ferranti were doing um, when uh, Orion started. Uh, I'll then sir, give, uh, say a few words about what Orion actually was, its specifications, um, and all these things will be in extremely overview terms. Um, nevertheless, there was an enormous amount in Orion, and therefore there's a lot of material to cover. I'll then try and say something about why Orion happened, and uh, something about the technology. Then go on to some of the innovative and unusual hardware things which you are unlikely to find in any other computer. Say almost nothing about the software features because we're nearly out of time. And then finally a little bit about the production and the customers uh, for Orion. So let's start off with the context for anti-making computers. By 1957, for anti computer department has had nearly a decade, eight years of experience of building computers. Now, they started back in 1949, and within eight years, they were mature, confident design engineers for computers. They're equal to anybody in the world in terms of innovation and ideas about how computers should be built. At that time, we were in the throes of, of moving over from valves, vacuum tube computers, to transistors. The IBM 650, which was a widely used computer at around that time, the mid-1950s, was a valve computer. As was the Ferranti Perseus, which was a sort of three times bigger than Pegasus giant data processing computer, the one on which I cut my teeth. We had a 100% export record, both of them went overseas. <laughs> <laughs> the Elliott 803, however, and the Sirius, the Ferranti Sirius, used transistors. So we were just in that transition state. You didn't build computers with valves anymore, you built with transistors. Ferranti had, was, uh, most, um, had been most concerned, and this was natural because of the way the industry developed in this country, with scientific the machines that came out of Manchester University were aimed at the scientific market. Pegasus largely, initially, was aimed at the scientific and mathematical market, the engineering market, and that's because the data processing market hadn't really emerged. But around this time, it was beginning to, and Pegasus II, for example, um, was, was aimed at commercial customers who were likely to have punch card machinery, uh, but we were looking to move to something more advanced. So there was the big debate about whether a computer was a scientific computer or a data processing computer and so on. And there were things to do with whether you had the offline style of the connecting peripherals and so on. We'll come to that in a moment. Um, here, uh, I've got a shot. <coughs> Uh, I want to, uh, one, one other thing is what was the competition like at the market. Well, English Electric were just launching their KD series of machines around that time. Uh, Leo 2 and Leo, Leo 3 was about to start, not being launched yet, but, but that sort of work was going on. AEA with the 1010, EMI with the 2400. The IBM 1401 wasn't allowed until 1959. So that was the kind of competition. Many, many manufacturers in this country making biggish machines, some aiming at scientific, some aiming at commercial work. Now, let's move on then to what Orion was. <coughs> Here's an artist's impression created around the time that Orion was being developed of what Orion would look like. And you can see the usual set of wardrobes on the right hand side and some peripherals scattered about, an extremely flat line printer in the background and a detached console, which was somewhat unusual. Most computers up to then had had their console, their control desk, their operating <coughs> switches fixed to the mainframe part of the machine. But here it was rather uh, elegantly detached with a swivel chair there. The, uh, the specification um, boiled down to this. I won't go into all the details of how this came about. 
But essentially, the key thing was that this was a time-sharing system, what's today called a multi-programming system. Well, that's a misnomer. It's a time-sharing system. That's what we called it, and that's what it is. And it's arguable that it may well be the world's first uh, time-sharing system. Certainly, in, in concept of the way it was done, I think that is probably true. Uh, it did take a long time to develop, however. It was a machine which had a peripheral bus. Now, I put that in inverted commas because I never thought of it that way, <coughs> although uh, Charles Lindsay has pointed out to me that this, this was an expandable machine and that there was a standardized way of attaching different sorts of peripherals, and I can see that now. <coughs> so it was, that was fairly innovative to have this standardized way of connecting different sorts of peripherals. It was aimed to be expandable from medium-sized up to large systems. And clearly this was a, a marketing requirement, but we have to bear in mind that at this time nearly all computers were technology driven. There was hardly any market lead as to what was required. The engineers would say, this is what we could build, you the salesman would <coughs> say it. And, and, but nevertheless, of course, feedback from the field indicated that what we needed, as much as anything for economy of production, was to make systems variable in size, variable in cost, and you make the system, you design the system to have that expandable capability. Finally, it had a very powerful instruction set, what we would call a complex instruction set, <coughs> and, and good data formats for card uh, data, MacTave data, MacTave data, and so on, uh, and suitable for both data processing and scientific work, there were floating point uh, instructions in there, as well as uh, super, uh, very good table lookup type of things which the um, uh, commercial data processing would be. Uh, that's sort of the overall specification. Now, why time sharing? Why did time sharing come about at this time? Well, it was all to do, and it was clearly perceived at the time, that there was a great mismatch between the speed of the electronic computer, the rate of the two things, and the speed of the peripheral dispatch. Typically, in granted terms, at the same readers, paper and punches, but also card readers and card, and card punches and line printers this dreadful mismatch in speed. And it was obvious that the computer can't do anything until the card reader, say, has read the card, and that was a slow operation, and similarly can't do anything until the previous line has been printed and so on. Um, and this must be one of the reasons why the company had focused on scientific computers, because that's a much easier problem to deal with, where you haven't got this problem of, uh, not so severely, problem of a lot of data traveling in and out of the computer, uh, but in a, in a commercial data processing scenario, these are the problems. And it, it's like this. There's a computer, perhaps, with magnetic tape. Perhaps this could well be a Pegasus 2, for example, with a card reader attached to it, perhaps a buffer, so that the cards are ready into a buffer and <coughs> the computer stored to be operated on by the program, and there the line printer with the forms out. And what's the computer going to do? It's going to wait for the card to be read. And then it's going to process the data there and write the file. And then it's going to copy that file or something to the line printer. And then it's got to wait for the printer to print its last thing. So a lot of hanging about and waiting for 50% <coughs> of the time, as it were, the computer's waiting for the peripherals, regarded as slow and inefficient and quite right. And this was clear to everybody. So, what was the traditional way of handling this problem? Well, you detach the peripherals, the slow peripherals from the computer, and you put, for example, converters, and this is one of the ways Leo, for example, worked, and the IBM machines worked, that the cards were read, processed by a converter, put onto magnetic tape, for example, and similarly for the printer, that Perseus had a printer, with a mag tape deck and a huge converter in a separate room. When you wanted to print your uh, premium demands, you carried them out of the computer, carried the mag tape out of the computer room into the printer room, and there it was printed. This meant that you could have, for example, several card readers and converters uh, and mag tape decks and similarly printers, then you could tailor the size of the installation to the kind of job you were doing and try to keep the computer busy. Sometimes these converters would be connected directly to the computer. But you can see the idea that there's a sort of central interchange there where the back tapes are carried out by operators. And so we can copy the cards to the file and at the same
same time process from the laptop to the file, and at the same time copy the file to the printer, and so on. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, it's expensive because these converters are doing a computer's job in a way. They have to read the cards and format them from the back dates and so on. Furthermore, it's very inflexible that once you're set up with those converters and peripherals and so on, that's what you've got and that's what your job has got to fit to. So, the right time sharing aimed to overcome this. It's going back to attaching the card readers and peripherals to the computer directly, many of them uh, with magnetic tapes, and by having multiple programs simultaneously in the computer, sharing the time of the computer, we could copy the cards to files and at the same time process the files out at the same time, copy files to printers. All these with separate programs, incidentally, and at the same time do program development which you couldn't do on any of the other things. And this clearly was more flexible and efficient. And the key was, would you be able to have multiple programs in the computer at the same time and run them to share the time with the computer? That was the issue. Now, there are certain implications about trying to time share like that. One is that program security is paramount. It must be impossible, of course, for one program that's in there sharing time with its fellows to interfere with its fellows in any way, either by malicious programming or by accidental programming, or if possible, by hard, if even as a hardware failure, you wouldn't want one program to interfere with another. That's a critical first implication of being able to have little time sharing machines. And these implications, we'll see in a moment, how some of these were built into the Orion design. Now, because of that expected flexibility, multiple programs and so on, it probably implies that we're going to need some built-in controlling software. Here's a novelty. What customer is going to pay for equipment for software uh, which didn't belong to him? It's the customer, it's the supplier's software. It was a novelty to have this idea of putting software in the computer permanently to control the computer. Of course, machines like Pegasus had initial orders. They were, that was the sort of input routine built in on the drum that would read things in. But by no means uh, could any of that be regarded as what we would regard as an operating system today. Something which had sort of conducts the orchestra and waves that on the design box to do. Finally, uh, another implication is that the peripherals must be able to do their own data transfers. Because there's no point in in attempting this, um, this uh, time sharing and trying to get the utmost out of the computer if we're going to have to spend some of the computer's time in actually controlling the peripheral transfers. So uh, what we look for is that once a peripheral had been told to start moving some data into or out of the computer, it, the peripheral could get on with it uh, uh, on, on its own. Now, what that means is that the peripherals need their own controllers to control them, and they should be independent and autonomous. Each peripheral should have its own controller, which once triggered, got on with the job. What's the job? Well, the job is moving data from a punched card, say, into the store of the computer, or copying some data out of the computer store and the magnetic tape, say. That's the job. The peripherals controllers are going to need access to the computer store. So does the computer need access to the store. So what's going to happen? Well, the uh, peripherals are given priority. And they're given access to the store. And if the computer tries to use the store at the same time, then I'm sorry, the computer must hesitate. By the computer, I mean the program running in the computer. will have to hesitate for a little bit while the peripheral controller grabs the store, puts or gets its data, and then moves on. So that's, that's sort of a, that's how you implement that first, that last implication of independent controllers. Now, another thing that's quite important to do with the first requirement that the programs don't interfere with <coughs> one another, um, is that uh, a program, well, it's, it's good to do with the independent or others controllers as well, a program might have passed card reader to read a card. And then it wants the data from the card. Well, what's the program going to do? It's going to try and read the store locations where the card data is going to be put. It must do that too quickly because the card hasn't read it yet and put it in the store. So the program's got to be locked out until the card reader controller has put the data in the store. Now the program, the programmer who wrote the program must be um, the task of knowing about that and have to deal with it. The hardware is going to do that. The program is going to be locked out if it's the program tries to use an area of the store which is currently being used 
it's peripheral. And then we'll see about walking clock. <coughs> Furthermore, a program that's in there, in the store, with some data area in the store for the peripheral buffers and so on, is given this reservation of storage. Let's say, for example, 20% of the store has been given, and by no means must it be allowed to get outside that reservation and trample on anybody else's data. So we need to implement a way of preventing a program getting outside its allocated area of the storage. And the way this to visualize this is here is the working <coughs> store um, in the computer. You'll see how big it is in that one. And the program, when it's loaded into the store, this is one of the several programs that are loaded into the store of the computer, it's been allocated that area of storage to go back line around. That's the area of this program that has been allocated. You can do what it likes inside there, but whatever it does, so it must not tread outside that boundary. That's, that's the requirement. Now, it's locked out from accessing locations outside the black boundary. We'll see in a moment how that's dealt with. This particular program may be, have ins instituted a peripheral transfer. It wants data from a car. So it says to the peripheral, get going, here is the starting address and the ending address of the area that I want you to put the card data in. There it is, surrounded in blue. And the uh, peripheral controller says, okay, I'll start moving data from the card into that area. And it does that by accessing the store when it needs to, causing the computer to hesitate. And the starting address, of course, once it's got the first word into the store, uh, then that's in, and the program can be allowed to get hold of that if it wants to, but not the rest of it. So the bottom line of that blue box walks slowly up the store as the card data comes trundling in, and the program is perfectly entitled to accept that, to access that, because that's good data. So you've got the picture that a program reads in the card, getting a lot of data in, processing that data, and as it were, tracking up along after the data, after the data comes in, very efficient way of allowing the computer to get on with its work and yet not allowing it to overrun into an area of store which is not yet valid. That's called uh, a peripheral lockout, uh, the, the hardware that allows access outside the blue line, not inside the blue line. So you've got a picture now that a program can access those memory locations that are between the black and the blue. And if any violation occurs, for example, a program tries to access outside the black area or in the blue area, then this is detected by hardware. So it's very, very quick. And that, that uh, violation, the reservation violation or the peripheral lockout violation, uh, is sent as a signal uh, to cause the computer to switch to the time sharing routines in the organization program, which we're going to come on to later. Uh, but the important thing is that here we have a mechanism for protecting one program from another, um, and, and yet allow each program to work at, at full speed within its, within its area. I should point out, of course, that when the computer can only do one thing at a time, and when that program is running inside that box, box black box, all the other programs which are happen to be in the store are suspended. They're not doing anything. What's going to happen is as soon as this program is locked out, as it is likely to be when it tries to impinge on the blue line, that's not, a, that's not an error or a misdemeanor in way, it's just part of the way the program runs. As soon as it's locked out into the timeshare, and the timeshare says, OK, you're suspended, open starts another program, which will have a similar picture. So the various programs which are in the store will be being switched into by the timesharing routine, which you can't do later as these various events occur uh, with, uh, within particular programs and within the hardware. All extremely efficient and very quick. Now, so we've, got, we've covered these two things. Now, this can only work if the hardware works. Uh, it depends on the addresses that are floating around, the data that's being passed around uh, is good data. So there has to be significant amount of hardware in the machine for integrity checking of the various data transfers, particularly of things like addresses and control information. This was largely done by parity checks. Uh, so that's, again, a design consideration which was taken into account that 
first paramount uh, implication of time sharing. No program must, must interfere with another under any circumstances, even if possible under hardware and failing conditions. So parity checks throughout the machine and in all the hardware, but a, a vital part of the design of the machine. Lastly, the, the suggestion that you would probably need a built-in piece of software to uh, monitor all this. The organisation monitor prom program is this, OMP, the well-known OMP. If anybody knows where there's a source or even a binary of OMP, we'd be thrilled to bits because it was a very important, very sophisticated, uh, and yet not very big piece of program. We'll come on to it a little bit more, but not much more later. Now, now let's turn to the peripherals which were available on Orion. I'm still talking about Orion specification. The, there was a wide range of peripherals and it was centered on uh, that this was to be a data processing machine primarily, but good for scientific work. In fact, very good for mixed work. Uh, and uh, disk, disk files were not really common. I mean, I probably don't know at this time. You had to depend on magnetic tape for your big data files. And the Ampex Separ 300, the later TM2 uh, deck, was chosen. One inch magnetic tape with 16 tracks, uh, operating at 90,000 characters per second. And one of those tapes would hold uh, 2.8 million words, which I think is about 16 megabytes. Uh, so it was a big, big reel, and the reel was big as that holding magnetic tape with that data on. And that was the primary uh, file storage system on Orion. Ferranti traditionally used paper tape as a input and output, and so Ferranti paper tape readers at those speeds were available, teletype and etc. paper tape punches. It was going to be for car for data processing, typical installations probably already had card, punch card is, um, installations and so they would need to read the files of cards so uh, the card readers and punches were interfaced uh, and for data processing again you needed a lot of line printing output and the ICT665 was the uh, workhorse line printer, 600 line printing printer, very noisy chunky thing and I think uh, latterly the Analex imported Analex line printers were used over cheaper than the ICT machine and more reliable and at uh, the same speed. Uh, there was the availability of flexor writer typewriters, 10 characters a second. And at this time, we're talking, you see, about design decisions, specification, and so on, in the 1957, 58 sort of time frame. The Teletype 33 typewriter had not been released at that point. Um, the flexor writer typewriter was a good running uh, input output device. The Creed <coughs> teleprinter was not suitable because it couldn't be expanded beyond five holes. Uh, that's to say 32 characters set, 32 plus ship characters. Uh, and this, for data processing, it was recognized that you needed at least six bit characters uh, in the computer and preferably outside as well. So the FlexWriter, although it was expensive, was chosen as the paper tape editing and input output device. Uh, one machine had multiplex data inquiry stations. <coughs> it would have data inquiry on keyboards, which were multiplexed into the computer, and the result shot out to a printer-only flex uh, One or two of the machines had electrodate to half-inch tape decks, which were Pegasus compatible, particularly, well, you'll see later, one of Ferranti's in-house computers, and this was needed course for uh, data transfer and upgrading from one machine to another to be able to copy all the files onto the new machine. One machine had a Hoff Powell scanner, uh, which today we would regard as, a, as an image scanner, I think. It was a huge device used for scanning the images from bubble chamber photographs of tracks of nuclear particles, and that thing went to um, uh, Harwell. Uh, where they used it for um, doing uh, scientific analysis of <coughs> these uh, particle tracks. And finally, there was a zeronic printer. I remember seeing that um, in, uh, in West Gordon, and I believe it was interfaced to one of the machines. I'm not sure whether it was a customer who 
you'll learn about perhaps that later, uh, a fearsome de device which shot paper out like newsprint, uh, 300,000 lines per minute, paper stopped it bursting into flames because of the uh, tone of the signal. Uh, here's a 665 hammer printer, there's a picture from the past, uh, and uh, that, uh, Peter Turner will remember how vividly how this rattled through masses of paper, it was not very good printing, but it did do 10 lines a second, which is pretty astonishing. Really. Uh, there's a flex writer, beautiful heavy duty thing, I believe they were originally designed to be good enough to be used on United States battleships. It felt way like that. Um, and that could produce um, seven pole paper tape, six data tracks, and a bit. Uh, so it would be an up and lower case letters as well as the full alphabet and the full um, punctuation set and numerals and so on and so forth. Um, here's an example of the neat engineering that we're on. This is Brian Sutton in front here. I don't know who the others are, but maybe here. Um, the, the, you can see that the computer consists, as all computers did, of a series of wardrobe cabinets. Uh, these had a door which opened uh, one on uh, each side of the cabinet. The cabinet was bolted to the floor, so that when the door opened, you could put it over. Um, uh, you can see that uh, it was quite neat. Everything is sort of beautifully uh, rectangular and square and so on. Um, and you can see how the bays of the computer sort of recede into the far distance. You want another line printer, right? You have another cabinet and bolt it on. It was all beautifully modularly bolted together. Um, here's the drum bay. Uh, if, I, if I just uh, retire on one, um, the, the drum is at this end behind the oscilloscope. The, the two the magnetic drums are here. Um, and the drums are mounted on this end of the computer. You want another drum set? Right, the bolt for the drum bay. So the machine expanded in this direction by bolting more drum bays on, and in the other direction with more peripheral bays on. So here's the drum bay. You can see two drums, one above the other there, with the electronics on a pull-out sort of slide. That had to be done that way, of course, because the next drum bay would mask that. If you wanted to get it with the electronics, you could only pull it out that way, and you couldn't have the swinging door because the drums were in the way. Those drums were very, very heavy, and um, there was a danger of the whole thing tipping up if both drums came out on their runners at the same time. They slide out those drums on runners. Very heavy duty sort of filing cabinet kind of drums. Uh, but there was a rule where you only get, well, got one drum out at a time. And another thing I've realised recently, you always switch the drums on quite a long time before you wanted to use the system the machine, the switch on the machine, because there were drum heaters. And the drums were heated up with a thermostat to control that so that they were in a stable environment before you started to use them. Um, I can't remember whether they were heated up before they were allowed to rotate or not, probably. This is the peripheral bus. Now, as I said, we didn't regard it as this. This, this is the centre wire of the computer. What we're looking at is the base of three of the bays uh, with no doors on these bays. And down the centre of these bays are a lot of printed circuit panels. It's just straight through printing, you can do anything except go left there. Um, and similarly, it's the same on the other side, except the printed circuit panels, <coughs> double sided printing. Um, these, these were connected together, these printed circuit things, these horizontal connections, with flexible printed circuits. You see some of them dampening down, which were all clamped together with what we call crinkle strips, little pressure, little corrugated sort of accordion strips and screws and clamps and so on. So when you join the bolted machine together and assembled it, there was no plugging, there was no soldering in the wires. Charles, I remember Charles Lindsay once saying, we've designed this machine so it could be assembled with a screwdriver and a spanner. Well, it was very like that. You made these bays in the workshop, <coughs> and you brought them together and you clamped these bits together. And miraculously, it was reasonably low because you were really just pressuring, pressure holding these printed circuits together. These, the, most of these things, that are the, the, the flexible printed circuits that are hanging around, are, are the ones which join the centre wiring to the door, and it's fixed. So you can open the door, and there's that flexible printing. Now, that was all pretty miraculous, really. I mean, I really was exploiting printed circuit techniques, which had 
only been going for a few years, really, um, at, this, at this early stage in 1957. Uh, and they were all gold-plated. It must have cost the earth to make those things. Um, but, but very neat, very good, very standardized, simple, neat engineering. And, and the, the cabinet is a little bit higher than those, because I think there's seven sort of <coughs> shelves there, and they were a total of 11 in the box in the cabinet. Uh, that's what Orion was like physically. Now then, the numbers. It had a word length of 48 bits, and it's quite long. That was bigger than any machine we built so far, uh, except Ursus, which had a 78 bit word, that's an old story, uh, which could hold eight of these six bit characters. It had a core store, pretty innovative. Core stores have been going for a few years, and were commercially available by 1956, 57. Uh, and this was uh, this core store, you could choose any size from 4 to 16 kilowatts, or 4 to 16 kilowatts. To my knowledge, I don't think any machine was delivered without 16 kilowatts. I think they had the whole whack. Uh, this had a 12 microsecond cycle time. <coughs> Six microsecond access time. Not the world's fastest store, but the intention was to sacrifice speed for uh, reliability. It sacrificed it because we had to go through three different designs of store before we found one that was reliable. Uh, it, it had, it was one of the things that held up the development of the machine. The initial store was unreliable, the replacement one we tried in house wasn't very reliable, and the bought in store was reliable. It, for simple instructions, uh, the machine, the simple instructions would, would operate in about that sort of time, 30 to 60 microseconds, so 60 microseconds. Um, you can see that for a simple instruction with three store accesses <coughs> that, that fits together, that's one to fetch the instruction, one to fetch the operand, and one to write the operand back. Uh, most instructions would be longer than that, although they were complicated instructions, and therefore you've got a lot of work done for a microsecond. Multiply, for example, uh, varied in, in time, of course, depending on the operands, but it was quite fast multiply. And peripheral hesitations, I mentioned earlier that the autonomous peripheral controllers would get on doing their own job, accessing the store for the moment they needed to put a word in or get a word out. And such a hesitation took 16 microseconds maximum, could take as little as six, uh, and that was that would slow the computer down uh, by that tiny amount. A very interesting uh, number is how, how quick can you switch from one program to another? Well, the answer is around about 500 microseconds, um, which seems an awful lot, but on the other hand, uh, when you compare that with the instruction times, uh, it's, it's a, it, was, it was remarkably quick. Uh, it was hardware, there was a lot of special hardware to help the time sharer uh, program, uh, switch between application programs. Instruction format was quite complicated. It was a 48-bit word in the machine, and the whole word was used for an instruction. So the most significant end with the S bit, 1 bit, and then you can see various uh, fields in the instruction. The signal bit um, caused the, the hardware uh, would detect if that number was zero and cause the time share of uh, the operating system to be entered uh, on the grounds that it was likely that if the program had gone bad and had jumped into data, it would be quite likely to be a zero there. Uh, the next is the function bits, which gave you gave us 15 groups of instructions, each with eight instructions in. The two addresses, the X address and the Y address, those 15 bits enable you to address uh, a full 16,000 uh, uh, words. Uh, incidentally, we could also address individual characters in a word, but it was a slightly more involved process the way that was done. Uh, the Z address is where uh, typically the answer would be put, only six bits, the first 64 locations in the reserved area of the program were regarded as accumulators, uh, and they, that's where the answer would go. Unless you wanted to use the Z 
state address which you could as a modifier an index register, in which case the TX or TY or both would use the state address as a modifier register to modify the X or the Y or both addresses. So you can see already there's a fair amount of complication there that we could do index, index, um, uh, index addressing uh, on one or both or either of those uh, main addresses. <coughs> and finally, the um, replacement, it's caused, if they were set, caused the address for the operand not to be the address which is in the X digits, but the, what's in the address in the storage location addressed by the X digits, the indirect addressing essentially. So when you have indirect addressing modified with pre modification as well, you could have an extremely complex way of accessing uh, an operand, uh, but all were very quick, all within one uh, instruction type. Very powerful, but extremely hard to get your head around. Okay, that's sort of an overview of the machine specification. And why did it happen? I think it's fair to say that to an extent, Orion happened um, because of the technology was there to do it. It was, it was a technology push um, rather than uh, anything else. The way it came about was that the neuron circuit was invented in about 1955, 1957. Uh, this is a neuron. Um, it's a plug-in package um, to do the form of logical operations on signals. It, it was originally, it's, uh, the idea of the neuron was that here we are with the new framework transistors coming out. Are they expensive? If we want to make gates and use these in computers, we better be as economical as we can with the, the expensive transistors. So the, the idea was to get as much logical power out of a circuit as you could using as few transistors as possible. And it, originally it only had one transistor, but that was very rapidly changed to two. And, and the circuit had been proven, this design of circuit had been proven in an experimental machine in the laboratory in West Gordon here, um, in a machine called the Duke, which was the neuron test bed. I believe, and I hope someone later will be able to look at this to confirm with me, that this is a newt package. Uh, it's, it's been depopulated, uh, but it's a very simple plug-in package without any components on. And I think that was the kind of circuit originally, um, the original neuron, until it was refined after the newt had found various things in it. And, the, and these, these genuine neuron circuits were then used in a machine called Sirius, a small machine about as big as a desk. Um, and they, they were highly successful, very economical, very low power, very powerful logically. Um, and these circuits were designed in the days when the norm was to make serial computers, or parallel computers, serial ones, the data flow on one wire. Uh, one bit after another. And consequently, they were designed like Pegasus packages with an inherent built-in one clock time delay. Although, to be fair, you could also wire these up to the half a clock time delay. But they always gave either a whole or a half digit delay. Absolutely perfect for making serial computers because you could make a string of these gates and the data would trickle through as in uh, serial transmission. And they were very, very powerful, logically. Here's the circuit diagram. This is probably the deepest technical part of the encounter. If you move on and uh, get started. On this, this is the circuit diagram of the neuron as used in Sirius and on Orion. And the important aspect is this here, which is the transformer at the front end. And those who were at the Elliot 802 lecture two or three months ago, will recognize that this is just the same. The difference is that in the Elliot 802, the ferrite in the transformer was a square loop hysteresis type of thing, which actually switched when signals were put on the front. <coughs> in the case of the Ferranti circuit, they said, all that's for the birds, making these, tra making these transformers 
uh, it is core. And to make that switching decision is slow, it's expensive, it uses a lot of power. We'll use a linear ferrite, and this is a perfectly stood standard linear transformer. And it works by putting a standard current through a winding, and that standard current, it's not really absolutely, uh, can either go up the winding or down the winding. And if you send 9 milliamps off that winding and down this winding, then they cancel out and you get nothing on the output. And so you'll only get something on the output winding here if there are more positive going inputs than there are negative going or absent inputs. So this is what uh, was often called ballot box logic. The thing only gave an output if more people voted for an output on the front uh, than didn't vote for an output. And we'll see later that it is very, very powerful uh, in terms of the logical facilities it provides. Well, the signal came out of here if it was supposed to speak through some very complicated diode switching, which nobody can remember how it works without having to go through the book which explained it. Um, Ken Johnson and Gordon Scarrett invented this circuit. Then the signal that had been detected from the transformer was stored in a little capacitor here, and one digit time later, or half a digit time later, it was output through here, through this circuit here, and the 9 milliamps was switched up here and came out. And there's the 9 milliamps going out to somewhere through a lot of more input transformers and eventually to ground. Now, uh, it, originally it just had that transistor. Later it was found you needed this as well. Now notice I keep talking about currents. 9 milliamps, it's a current. It's not a voltage system. You could put many of these input windings in series with one another on one of the output signals. <coughs> Many, I mean like 20 or something. Tremendous fan out. Very good fan out. Uh, but uh, it's no good looking at the voltage on this point or any other point because the voltage hardly changes. It's about earth moves a few millivolts. What actually changes is the current that flows through there. So if you want to see uh, what the current is in here, you've got to measure the current with the current transformer. And in the circuit here, in this circuit, there are some holes here, which the output wire goes around the hole, and that's what that loop is. And we were provided with little probes like this, like clothes pegs. It's a current transformer, and you could clip it on like that. And the signal coming out of here was an image of the current going through the uh, out of the circuit, transformed by this current transformer, and down to the oscilloscope. And now I think we may be able to actually see that in operation. Keith has very kindly and bravely built this piece of equipment to the specification. <laughs> Here is an oscilloscope. And we've got on the oscilloscope two probes, the two red probes you can see in the front there, connected through probe amplifiers, authentic Orion probe amplifiers. The little current out of the clothes peg flows, the little top on, and flow, flows out of the uh, uh, probe into the amplifier. You see nothing until you clip it on. Can you do it slowly, Keith, so that you can see that the more you clip on and the less you clip on, so you get more or less signal. So, and can you turn it over, Keith, so that if you connect, put the probe on the wrong way up, then the signal's the other way up. <laughs> now, the bottom, the bottom line is a neural pulse. Much of the flickering and, and mosh is an artifact of our digitizing scope, so we can worry about that too. So that's typically what neural pulses look like. The bottom line is a pulse which we've made to come out one in every eight pulses, 16 microseconds apart. The other line is a series of ones. They're, they're just saying one, 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 continuous pulses. And you can see that the, <coughs> there is always uh, half, a, half the time is a pulse and half is no pulse. If we can go on to divide by two, divide over by two, here we've got alternate pulses. And you can see one, north, one, north, one, north. And then the next one is divide by two again. <coughs> It's divided by four, so it's one, 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 one,
fascinated by this incredible thing, and we'll find the diagram later. Mm. Is it saying zero? Like this, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. one to mm. run. Right, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got a delay line, eight bits long, with a half adder, a serial circuit. And we can single shot and put one pulse in. And so as we keep single shot, you can see it's adding up. And when we go to the run, it goes flat out faster than the eye can see. <laughs> go back to the single shot. Right, that's it. OK, thank you very much. Now, what I want you to all remember and tell your grandchildren is you have seen genuine Ferranti neurons working. <laughs> <laughs> you will very unlikely see that ever again unless Keith comes up with his equipment. So that's that's what we were faced with. These are the sort of signals. We use these clip-on probes and so on. Thank you very much, Keith. That's a real tour of the horse by Keith to get that power supply made and all that equipment. So very good. Okay, so that's what neurons were, and that's what they were like. Now, the point is that these have been developed in West Gorton, and they existed. And the question is, well, we've made a serious, a small computer. We've, got, we've spent all this effort making these circuits. We'd better build a computer, wouldn't we? And here is a sort of, this is a very strange part, which I haven't really fathomed yet. But Ferranti was a company of innovative engineering, very much freewheeling in a sense, provided that they didn't lose gross amounts of money, and uh, people were allowed to more or less <coughs> what they liked, um, on the chance that it was likely, if it was interesting, innovative, good engineering, then that was good. Um, neurons looked really good. Um, and you could use your for making computers. Okay, let's make a computer. Um, so the target was uh, let's let's try building a big data processor to follow Pegasus and Perseus and suit the emerging market for commercial data processing. Right, ideal. Neurons were great, they have been proven in serious and so on. Um, and it is remarkable how informal it started. Gordon Scarrett said, OK, you, you get on with it with a small team, a team of about four people. And it was essentially Charles Lindsay who took it. And he said, um, Charles Lindsay, Tim Turner, and um, John Thompson, Jim Hill later, um, get on and build this computer. And as far as I can see, there's no marketing requirement, there's no budget, there's no plan, there's no Nothing formal at all. Certainly, the project leader had no written instructions, or you know, nobody ever said you're the project leader except sort of over coffee. A remarkable thing. And yet, what a wonderful design came out of this small team, close knit, good communication, extremely bright, clever people who got vision about how to get these requirements for a big timeshare data processing system into um, being implemented. Started roughly in 1957, first delivery in 1963. That tells a story, doesn't it? Six years it took, many of our best years. Um, there were fearful te fearsome technical problems by 1962. Uh, you will read in books like John Wilson's recent history of um, of the Ferranti Company and Martin Campbell Kelly's Business and Technical History of ICL, words like neurons were no good and then killed the rhyme. Well, neurons were very good. Unfortunately, they were not very good at very long machines because the kind of problem was that it was very difficult to maintain <coughs> clock synchronism from one end of the machine to another so that if a signal went down there and came back, it wasn't in time, and you got little snigs going through the transformers, and all sorts of artifices were invented to try and improve that, like adding two more transistors to every one of these, doubling the number of transistors, um, and of course that sort of defeated the economical idea, and, and of course, I mean, what it boiled down to is the neuron technology was superseded because no one had forecast that transistors were going to be so cheap. 
at least. They hadn't forecast them in our department. Yeah. <laughs> so, so here we are, off we go in 1957, uh, in a very informal way, let's build a big data processor. And, and the sales people followed on. You know, okay, right, what are we going to call it? And et cetera. Um, it's, uh, overall, it had a kind of parallel architecture, but with a lot of serial features. And the point about a parallel architecture was uh, that you were likely to get higher performance using a parallel architecture and a lot more hardware than parallel. And of course, this hardware was cheap, wasn't it? But not that cheap. We'd better have something serial. So we'll see that there was a combination of uh, parallel and serial aspects. And these neuron circuits were so good at serial operations that uh, that um, sort of fell out naturally. So basically, it was parallel things like the information from the store came out 48 bits at a time, 49 because it was a parity bit. And so on. Um, this diagram, if only we'd had this diagram in the 1950s, we would have understood the machine a lot more. <laughs> I've only created it recently and I think you could pay to it because the one that we like. Uh, it was the whole machine was built around the core store, we've already said 12 months in particular, with what's called a store transfer gate, uh, which took the 49 bits out of the store, 48 bits was parity, and carved them on this. The computer itself consisted of a number of registers, and I mean, this is what you'd expect in a computer. They were 48 bits long, they were quite big registers, the G register, the H and so on. Uh, the H register was the one where the arithmetic was done, it was what we would now call an ALU, an arithmetic and logical unit, and an extraordinarily clever design. That is accumulator number three, let us say. However, the machine that might not, that might, wouldn't be number three, but it might be 3074 or something. So you have to add on an offset to that address, depending on where the program is in the store. And that's done by the data point register. And within your address, one of your accumulators, that number is added to the data point register to give the real address. And of course, that's a very critical register. You don't let programmers get hold of that, only the organization program can get access to the data in one register. Novel feature and appeared in any machine before. Now the tour de force of course was on the other side of the machine, the peripheral systems. <coughs> there are all those peripheral controllers with their naked peripherals. As far as possible, there was no uh, intelligence in the peripherals at all, there were bare mechanisms. The peripheral controller drove the function lines and the hammers and the, and the Tank clutches and so on. And each peripheral control had its lockout box. This is where it kept its addresses and where it was currently transferring. And the, all the peripheral controllers got access to the rest of the machine via a thing called the central peripheral control, which you can see there, linked into the store transfer gate. Okay. So a peripheral reading the card, peripheral controller says, OK, I've got a word to put in the store, sends the address from its lockout box down that bus. Uh, into the central proof of control saying so here's the address, can you take deal with it? The central proof of control issues the address to the store, tells the computer to stop doing his thing, manipulates the data, gets it out, sends it back, and so on. And indeed, in the central proof of control is the bit that adds one to the starting address as you move up the store with your proof of your block of data, so that address is going on, well, that, that's added every time that's uh, the central proof of control. Uh, doesn't access. Notice that there are two phases of controls, phase one up there and phase two down below. The reason for this is because of the design carefully worked out the various timings, they recognised that you could in fact allow two peripherals to be accessing the store more or less at the same time. Not exactly at the same time, but sort of interleaved like that. And you could have two peripherals accessing the store interleaved uh, close together. And all the um, all the peripheral controllers which were on the right hand side of the machine were on phase one, and all those that on the left hand side of the machine were on phase two. And the peripheral bus, all those printed circuit wires down the middle, were all duplicated either to go to that side or to that side. And the central peripheral control arbitrated between them. So we've got two simultaneous peripheral hesitations. That's really all they had to share. Uh, but the controllers did all the work. A tour de force. Now, I, 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 there are a few very interesting and innovative 
hardware things in Orion. More than a few. So much that I'm just going to pick on a few, which always made me slightly dazzled. Um, first of all, um, helical arithmetic. Now, that's not the really, not helical arithmetic. Well, it was all a, it was a problem of neurons, although no one I think would be prepared to run an answer that. A helical arithmetic unit was an ingenious way of using serial and parallel logic to do arithmetic on 48 bit numbers. And it came about because this intrinsic neuron delay, the, I mean, the part of the design was it either delayed a microsecond or two microseconds. Um, meant that if you wanted to calculate a carrot from one place in an addition to the next place, it couldn't take less than a microsecond because you needed one of these to do the calculation. Um, so that was that was the point, that it, it's a carrot between one place and another can't take less than like one microsecond using neurons with that intrinsic delay. Um, and the other aspect of it was that Charles Lindsay, when he had been in Cambridge, had been associated with a lot of statistical work on what carries were really like in, in when numbers were manipulated. And it got a lot of information about the statistical distribution of typical carry patterns. And the result was, well, first of all, a conventional adder, a 48-bit adder, a serial adder, um, would have all those bits, and then the carry, you know, if you add it, if it was a carry here, that was added into the next stage, and then you could add to that immediately, and it would take 48 microseconds to do the carry. So that's how long this would take to add numbers. 48 microseconds would be a long time, so compared with 12 microsecond store cycle. So enter the helical arithmetic union. I think at the time it was often called the spiral adder. But the pundits amongst us said, rubbish, a spiral does that. It explains that, like a spiral staircase. <coughs> so, what we have here is this, and of course that's instantly recognisable. Uh, each of these green boxes is a bit of the number, and I've shown 24 of them here in three groups of eight. And it, it, this was cunningly arranged so that two bits were in series with each other as a sort of serial loop. And that, that line there shows the two bits going round and round like that. Now, these two bits are 24 places apart in the word, so we've got a 48-bit word, so this might be bit number 47, and that would be 23, 46, 22, 45, 21, and so on. So the two halves of the word are at any moment in that top row, or in the other row, and they kept alternating as this goes around and around. That's a good start. Now, if you, made a, if you did an addition in this bit, and a carry came out, it would come out one microsecond later because it takes a microsecond to get through this bit. So you cunningly arrange this loop in the next stage to be one microsecond later in time. That's why I've shown it a bit dropped. And this loop is one microsecond later. And this loop, and so we could go on and we could get a picture something like the top. But that's no good. We wouldn't be, really, you know, not much better off. Aha, here's the cunning bit of the statistics. You now start again with these. All these are in the same timing as that. If the carry comes out of here, if it comes out of here, then for this, this loop here would have gone round enough time such that the equivalent's equivalent to poking it in as if it was there. If there isn't a carry, <coughs> then you've done these calculations early. And so all the way up, you've got this cunning sort of doing all the carries in parallel with one another, but staggered four bits apart. I'm going to stop waiting for my answer that in a minute. And the statistics said that you don't often get, or when you do get carries that lead to bridge this gap, it's not very often. But the, the PS resistance was the carry speed circuit. In addition to all that, special circuits detected if there were groups of ones, six ones in a row, and a carry coming in at the bottom. Must mean that a carry comes out at the top, you don't want to carries in here. So there were four special circuits which were looking for six ones in a row, and if they did, they jumped in and they were in time to get into that place without having to wait for all these loops to go down. Now, as I said earlier, it only takes three months to really understand this, and then you get the feeling of the 
cows going off like that and coming from the bottom and going up. A wonderful circuit, but an absolute pain to try and maintain because if something went wrong, it was almost impossible to see what's going on. Very clever piece of circuitry. The arithmetic unit with this and the other registers occupied a whole door of the line. Group three. I expect John Thompson can remember it well. <laughs> now what about these two? You need a backwards adder and a shingle shackle. <laughs> I don't know how many of your PCs at home have got shingle shackles in them. Probably not many. And what's all this about? Well, it was all to do with backwards numbers. Consider addresses moving to and from peripheral controllers. Down from the controller, down that phase one and phase two, across into the central peripheral control, down to the two address the store. It, those addresses were transported out on a pair of wires with eight bits in series to give you a total of 16 bits, 50 bits of address in parallel. <coughs> now, why on earth didn't you have 16 wires in parallel? Well, you had to have a bus to take the addresses up, another bus to bring it down, another bus to take addresses from the program which wanted to check the lockout up, and you needed phase one and you needed phase two, and the words were there. You couldn't afford all that power that was in there. So much more sensible to send these bits in series like that. Now, that led to a problem, however. In order to do um, lockout checking, you send an address to see whether it's uh, okay to use this address, or is it being locked out by the peripheral, the hardware has to do some checking of the address that you send, with those that are in the controller. And it is much, much quicker to check the lockouts if you start at the most significant bit, because that quickly <coughs> dismisses this as a problem. So you want to, you really have to do the checking from the most significant end first. But traditionally, serial data is always transmitted least significant bit first, because when the least significant bit comes, you can do some processing, decide if it's a carry before the next one comes and so on. But we've got a problem here because we've got the addresses travelling around the machine most significant first, and they have to because of the address checking. But you need to add one to them because the walking lockout needs to take the thing up as the buffer is being filled. So how on earth do you increment an address by one when it's coming at you backwards? Easy. Easy. Use a backwards adder. <laughs> uh, a very ingenious circuit, which I suspect was really I'm not sure which looked at these bits as they were coming past and was looking for where the digits first change from a 0 to a 1, last half from a 0 to 1, quickly put a peg in the ground there and said, right there is where you add one. And this, 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 this actually only took three weeks to understand this. Now, there's a further problem with this, that sometimes if you get a lockout and the, or a timeshare is being uh, entered, the timeshare needs to know where the lockout was, which address, because the timeshare is late and going to desuspend this program, and it needs to see whether it's okay to desuspend. It needs to know what situation is. So you want this backwards address to get back into the arithmetic unit and then into the timeshare. And um, unfortunately, it's backwards this word, so you need to turn it around the right way from it. Now, I don't remember whether you were, when you were a child you used to get to puzzle on the railway track, which had a thing going on. There, and then the there and the bridges and you had to shunt the trucks up there and shunt them around there. Well, that's what we have. We call it the shingle shackle. Now, it is complicated because those bits are two wires in series and you try to get them into a helical adder which has got the bits alternating that way, spiraling around the middle of the <laughs> So, I guess it was called that because the bits shingled in and shackled out. <laughs> so, I think that's what I doubt whether you've got one in your PC. <laughs> Very interesting. It didn't take long to understand that. <coughs> now, the next uh, interesting thing, for the time, we're talking 1957, it had a local civil time clock. And I always thought this was a very severe way of what we would now call a real time clock. Local civil time. It was very much standard and magisterial. And it was a clock uh, to uh, enable the time of day clock, to enable the time sharer to be interrupted periodically and to find the time in order to uh, do proper time accounting of the users of the machine. Who was using what resources for how long and when, because you can imagine with a machine with many programs running simultaneously, uh, concern had to be taken about how you knew what 
was going on at the camp at the time and charge the customers or the different departments or whatever. So a clock had, was provided. And the first clock was in a box about as big as one of these. In fact, it was arranged to fit in one of the shelves of a door. Made by a man called Saxby of Saxby Engineering in Liverpool. And I well remember him bringing this along and we put it in at the bottom of door 15. And it consisted of a thing like a motor car myelometer, a lot of wheels about, about that diameter um, in a row. And these wheels have multiple contacts on them. So that depending on the position of the wheel, so the four wires that came out had the binary coded decimal representation of the position. And then at the end was a synchronous motor about that big, driven off the mains with a crank which went round either every second or every minute, I can't remember. And that operated a lot of users and a lot of pawns came over like that. It was a delightful thing to watch. <laughs> All day long, night and day, and every time the moment came, push that wheel over. And if that wheel was at nine, it would be like the boat wheels. So it was just like a car speedometer ticking away at one minute or one second, I can't remember which. And wonderful and very low cost. The only thing it wasn't very good. And when you read the time of these wires, there was so much contact bounce and so on, that you were as likely to get midnight. It was usually midnight, by north, colon, north, colon, north, yeah. um, as the real time. So it wasn't much good. And later we turned to a firm called Brian's, uh, who made a thing called the Brian's Digitimer, which was a delightful little thing about this big, full of gears, similar to our I mean, a mechanical motor with mechanical switches, but a lot more reliable. And uh, that actually, you can see that. And that was the Digitimer, the local civil time clock. And I suppose we were expected at 2 o'clock in Sunday morning clocks going back and went to the engineer and they don't want to back <laughs> Now, uh, there was one little anecdote associated with this, which it caused an enormous amount of grief. It took us about three weeks to find the problem. There was uh, a signal from this clock, which occurred once a minute. And the purpose of the one minute interrupt was to interrupt the uh, organization program to force an entry to the organization program so that it, that, that program, could notice whether some application program was in a loop stop. If the program went into a loop stop and was just doing nothing, idly, the machine was, as it were, locked out. If there were no peripherals uh, running, then the machine was jammed in there. So you had to force the entry to the timeshare once a minute to get out of that remote possibility. So you had a signal once a minute. What was this signal? It was a neuron pulse. Microsecond wide, every 60 million pulses. So we had a waveform which had a mark space ratio of 1 in 60 million. Quite hard to see that on the scope. The stat was that on the prototype, which had, had so much wiring and changes and mods and extensions, that this signal had inadvertently got wired to the parity bit of one of those lockout addresses going on the <laughs> We spent weeks and weeks trying to understand why we were getting sporadic and random parity files in the peripheral system. And these delay lines, which were the, which were the things which held the addresses in the various lockout boxes, in the delay line storage, the delay store, we spent hours and hours tweaking these and adjusting them, trying to get them to be perfect. We were still getting parity errors. And Charlie eventually found it, Charlie Portman. I think we found it with this sort of device, which I invented. Um, this is a British standard cigarette packet. <laughs> <laughs> and inside there was a bit of logic and some probe, with some of these probes which we talked about earlier. I think it's the power. And now here is a little lamp. And when a pulse comes along at 1 in 60 million at the wrong moment, it lit the lamp and we eventually trapped it down by using that. We called it a weasel catcher. <laughs> and that, I believe that's the one or a copy of the one we made in the lab. Albert in the workshop probably assembled it to my design. 
and um, Keith McLaren brought it back from the Rutherford machine um, and was kind of brought it along to his shows today. So that's a bit of historic development part of it. Um, the, the last thing I'm going to mention on this theme is the microprogram root chart. Um, we always used to call it the root map, uh, but um, John Dora, I think, told me that um, wild, Tony Wild in the tech pod. So it's not a map, it's a chart. It had to be called the microprogram root chart. Now, the issue here is that we've mentioned the arithmetic unit with those registers. When instructions are obeyed, uh, those registers have to be manipulated so the data flows from one register to another in the right way. And it was resolved at the early stage of design that we would have a microprogram, uh, that's to say, a, a kind of uh, sequence of signals uh, to come out of the central part of the system to call the various registers to move the data. Now, traditionally, we would think of a microprogram as being a, a lot of instructions stored in some sort of regular hardware, such as a sequence of transformers, or um, nowadays in a read-only memory, and so on. Um, but it was thought that the, Orion, the, the neuron logic was so powerful with these transformers on the front end that the microprogram could be implemented actually by wiring these things together. And in a way, that was true. It was an ideal way of making a microprogram. The only thing is it did lead to fearful complication. And I would invite you to look at the logic diagrams on that end table afterwards to really comprehend that, that um, complication. It, it was fearful, fearsome. I was an engineer, uh, a field engineer uh, assigned to the development of the Orion Development Project. And so with my engineer's hat on, I soon, soon after I joined them, said, well, where are the lamps? Because if we look at the, that artist's impression, here is the control desk. And it's extremely simplistic. It's got a paper tape reader or two on this side, and the typewriter or the flex writer on the other side, a clock, all confronting computers and a clock, didn't they? I don't think that's anything to do with the local sort of clock clock. And about a dozen buttons. And the theory was, well, you, you know, what do you want lights and buttons and switches for? Everything is done by the typewriter. You communicate with the system by the typewriter. You don't need lights and buttons, as you did on Pegasus in those three years ago. Well, that unfortunately neglected a rather important part of the population, these maintenance engineers. They could be, you know, the machine broken, they can't use the typewriter for communicating, and it rapidly became apparent that this machine was going to be impossible to maintain unless we had a few lamps and switches. And again, I would take credit for uh, getting that off the ground. Uh, thanks to Charlie, you know, I tend to do this thing. I really think we ought to, and I can think of a way of doing it. Charlie Paul said, right, off you go, and do it. <laughs> and, and, and we did. And we made a very good system, um, which we were able to retrospectively fit. We understand the machine was all, almost working there, and yet we had to introduce these lamps and switches, and it involves slipping a little core, a little camera core, over the single wire, and bringing twisted pairs to amplify and so on. All, all worked extremely well. So that when when, when we actually built the console, it had all these lights and switches. Now, at least, you could get to grips with the, uh, what was going on in the machine for an engineer. Down at the bottom here is the key switch with a key in it. And that says normal. And the engineer, when he finished his maintenance, would turn the key to normal and walk away with the key. And that meant that the operators could use it because it was normal, but the operators couldn't use any of these switches. Um, and then when the engineer came back to main machine, he switched it from normal to engineer's mode, which should have made the lights and switches enabled them again. Um, but I digress momentarily. Um, the thing I was going to point out was the root map. I think Jeff Bounton um, proposed this. On the, here is the console uh, as it finally what came out. Um, and on this side here is the root map. And what it is, is a little, it's a chart, a sort of railway diagram of all the routes through the microprogram. If you're going to do a floating point instruction, you're going to normalise, and you do an addition or whatever, and the, you have to do a certain sequence of things with the registers to do, to do the formal instruction. And 
that chart shows the routes through the microprogram. And there was a little light at each critical point where there was something in the microprogram, a state, or a statisizer or something, with about 200 non lights on that chart, um, which um, lit up so that the engineer could get some clue when something goes wrong of what was happening. And so those two, the root chart and the lights, well, the lights are on all machines. But I think this idea of having a thing like a, a railway diagram, I've never seen any other computer like that, until we did the 2980, and then I said to them, why don't you have a root map? And they did it. Okay, nearly there. Uh, a few brief words on software features. I'm going to come back to the root map in a minute. Um, now, I'm, I have got very little to say about the software, not because it was unimportant, it was very, very important, uh, but I don't know much about it, and, it, and if I did, I realised that I would overstretch my time. So I suspect that I'm going to have to find, to persuade someone to give a separate lecture on software features. But let's just touch on something. First of all, the vital, the vital uh, test programs, without which the machine could never have been developed. I've got to tell the logbooks from the development of the prototype of Ryan, and as I read those logbooks, it's nearly all programmers on testing the 140, 142 found a problem. Engineers on solving that, engineers all through that shift. We were working three shifts, five days a week, trying to get this thing to work. Programmers would come on with the shift. They got a problem, they got a broken machine that didn't know how it worked. They were trying to write test programs, for example, conformance tests. Does this machine conform to its specifications. All we and then the four benighted programmers had to write these tests, not having a work to put the machine to work on, sort of thinking, well, they ought to do this and so on. Then they'd bring the test to work on the machine. Didn't work that way. Mostly it was because that bit of the design hadn't been properly uh, not to work or something like that. And uh, we'd, we'd spend a shift on the the programmers would come back, that bit's okay, move on to the So for years, it seems, it feels like years and years, programmers on, da -da -da, engineers on, and then eventually the thing was driven into submission and we got them to go to work. And all these conformance tests, which we would use as our standard test of the machine, if they ran the conformance tests, then the machine was a good machine, it's a CPU at least, uh, were called BIM, I think it meant binary tests or something. And here is a copy of BIM. It's probably the only surviving copy of the binary test programs for a wire, and that would be ready into the drum, and then from the drum, read into the computer for execution. Now, I'm very pleased to say that the author of this, who is present with us tonight, Ian Elliott, wrote the first working experimental time sharing. Now, to bear in mind, again, the machine was being developed, it was a time sharing machine, the organisation monitor program who was being written in uh, London. It was not uh, written locally. There were exp experienced programmers in London who were doing this. They um, uh, were assuming that it was a perfect machine, fully up to specification. For us to provide tests for that, um, we had our, our own test programmers writing things to test that viz a time share of the sort, but similar, uh, than the one that the London people would later uh, write. And so the first working time share was called IMP, um, and it depended on a primitive input scheme to input programs and so on. Long, long story. As soon as this started happening, then we could go mad with writing our own, the engineers writing their own programs. I wrote one which was able to take the um, time from the local civil time clock manipulated and put it out on bits on an oscilloscope so you could see the time on digits, probably one of the first digital clocks ever to exist. <laughs> um, uh, so that was very important to get the imp time share working. And I don't remember much about this, people can't know more about it. There was a hardware diagnostics program written by a group of the test programmers to help identify faulty circuits. Now this is different from the conformance test. The conformance test is to say the machine is good or it is broken and it is broken in the floating point area, so. 
the diagnostic test is a program which you load, which can then run certain tests and say, your actual neuron is number 3B26. And you could then go and exchange this for a good package. Uh, diagnostic programs are notoriously difficult to get to work. Um, but there was, there was um, uh, this, this work was being done. Uh, was it used in anger? Um, this is a photocopy of one of the log books, uh, 27th of April 1962. Um, if you can't read it, what it says is, the demonstration being over with a fair degree of success, it time shared in quite a nice fashion between the 665, the TR5 and TAN type, and the base load program. I've written at the bottom four separate programs operating independently. I realise now it was only three. The 665 was printing reams of stuff by one program. The TR5 was copying paper tape and copying it onto the teletype punch, so it was tape being copying it onto the punch. And the third program was a base mode that's just doing some arithmetic without peripherals. So the three programs there running, and he said it time shared, it was a demonstration, it didn't say who it was to um, earlier in the log. And then it said at 1720, put the store test in, went to T. Came back at 6 o'clock, store test going, no failures indicated. 10 past 6, the machine off to do lots for the 140.13, 142 order. That's the um, peripheral interrogation order. So, interesting stuff, snippets you can see in the log book. And so that must be a very, very early uh, authentic recording of time sharing on a computer, not a program. Mm -hmm. Now, to turn to the main um, time sharing program, OMP. Uh, which was created by George Felton and others in London. Um, as I said earlier, I would dearly like to get my hands on a copy of POM uh, because it would be well worth preserving as a very important early operating system, probably the world's first time sharing operating system. Um, it had organisation routines which allocated resources and maintained priorities amongst the programs, list and table and so on. And that would be that part of it would be a program and it has to do with the application programs in, in, in the sense that it would be a program which would be time shared with other programs. Um, the monitor routines are important, they service the interrupts when there was a reservation violation or a parity fail or whatever, and the monitor routines would deal with that. And by and large that was not time shareable. Um, but it also communicated with the operator, so it might say uh, on the typewriter, it might suddenly say uh, 14, 10, 25, that means 10 plus 2. Um, job, acto, tape, read, tape, deck 5, on load. It's just a brief message saying something about the tape. Uh, similarly, the operator could type in a message of the sort, um, give the address or something, and the thing would respond. So the monitor routine with the communication with the operators via the typewriter. <coughs> and lastly, the timeshare routine itself, um, as I said earlier, exploited special hardware to enable this very rapid switching between programs. Um, and there was close cooperation between the time designer of the timeshare routine and the designers of the microprogram for those special instructions. So that, for example, tables were put by hardware, but, but were put by software in the right place in the store that the hardware could get out and do rapid searching and so on. Um, time share obviously runs itself. The monitor routine, some of the monitor routines are time share, uh, others like service in the interim not time share. Very important program, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Other than when we had those programmers come up to test their on, on the Orion prototype, they brought them, they came up from London, they were staying up, and we were working on shifts, that's where we all, they had one of the shifts. Typically it was the day shift. And George Belkin was in charge. And he had his programmers, Dan Oistriker, Jeff Strauss, Ian Goodman and others, all lined up with their programmers to test. And as soon as one of them found his program admitted and the routine didn't work, George would shout, Next! And off he went, the next one came on, and he was sort of waving the baton, trying to get as much throughput as possible from this flaky machine with its few resources to get, get this test program done. No wasting time. Now, you're now in the Nebula program, Nebula language, which is like for a while, a business-oriented programming language, which means natural electronic business language. It's similar to COBOL, but it does actually predate COBOL, although I don't think it 
pre-page schematic. And you will now understand the logo in the top left corner of the slide, which is a great nebula with a rhyme. And uh, these, this, this um, uh, language had expressions like this. You wrote in semi-commercial English. If the rate is 5% of the date, the rate is less than 96. I mean, that's what you, you wrote to so compile it into binary <coughs> programs and other ones. If the card policy number is less than the main file policy number, then display cards all together. Quite sophisticated. By this time, all brands of computers were using mercury autocode or variants of autocode. So scientific users had a kind of a language. They could use autocode as part of a language. At this time in the United States, Fortran for scientific use was preeminent. Uh, for some reason, that didn't trickle into, uh, uh, into our machines because they weren't invented here, um, and COBOL was a twinkle in the eye. All, pro all application programs were written in machine code. So this time it really was a pain to write a big commercial uh, program in machine code, hence the need for the nebula. Um, the customers absolutely loved it. It was a major selling point for a while. Um, I, I, people have told me, like salesmen, ex ultra and southern, that this was the reason they were able to sell a lot, because they gave the customers a way of writing their application programs easily. There's a lovely story. Well, they promised a long life for them. It was written, it, it was created for um, Orion, uh, and I suspect that some customers were told that Parenti was going to support Nebula forever on all future ranges of machine. And had that happened, then that would have been wonderful for those customers. Uh, but I suspect that, uh, well, I don't think any other machine than uh, Orion 2 uh, used Nebula. Uh, so they perhaps were let down on that. But I think that was um, part of the sales work at the time. I can remember again the Nebula writers were Sandy Fraser and others who were in London writing this um, compile, to compile those statements into machine code. And it was a huge system. And uh, it was magnetic tape based, in fact. And so they would come in, come up to, to Westport for the week with their reels of paper tape and spend the boring punch on um, flexor writers. This is the compiler I'm talking about, a nebula compiler. They would run them through the tape reader and onto magnetic tape to so that they got their compiler on that tape. Uh, then they were ready to compile a example nebula program with statements like that. And I can well remember they'd gone through all this and they were at last ready to test a source. Uh, so they put the source tape in the reader, and that little shop, see, in the reader there, and started and map tape started using back the compiler up and down and so on and so forth. And they came for a bit and they're all standing around. Eventually, the tape would have clicked one cover. Like there is it! It moved! Great success! <laughs> so it was terribly, 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 terribly slow, certainly at that early stage. And uh, I know the metal box company later uh, had about 5% of its running time was um, compiling nebula programs. I suppose it improved, but it was uh, certainly a uh, great excitement when the paper tape really made one cover. Okay, we're nearly there. <laughs> These are the, uh, what I've identified as 12 prime customers. <coughs> um, this may, did Prudential have an iron one? Peter? No. <coughs> well, it's not a main one, because they're down in the logic diagrams. This is their configuration. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, maybe there were less than 12. Maybe there were 11. In John Wilson's book about Ferenti, he says 10. Uh, there were two computers, number north and number two, which were in-house. The prototype, which was in West Gorton, which was built, and the number two machine, that's his third cardinal, third order machine, went to Ferenti London Computer Centre in Newman Street. I installed that one, that was my um, And that was used for service work for potential customers who wanted to develop their programs before they got their machines and things like that. Um, but the, the real crucial one was the number one machine, Turis, which, you know, in typical fashion, our first major customer was across the sea, exported. Um, 
while others were interested in the Harwell and Rothamsted, Rothamsted Agricultural Research Station always made forward in their new community usage. They had the A401, the only, um, the only one that was made, a very early machine and, and can be regarded as a forerunner of Pegasus. Um, so as you can see, several, um, uh, really most of them commercial, uh, but all of them, I think, to an extent, did scientific kind of work on it. Now then, we've got to make a dozen machines or a dozen orders. We got to about, I suppose, 1960, 61 time. And the machine wasn't working. It hadn't been, hadn't one been open, but you know, look ahead, you have to build the machine. So this great big commissioning area was cleared uh, in, it had been number one shop in West Walker, and um, got ready for a big production line of arrivals. And look at this lovely set of soldiers. Those are the tape decks. Peter Hall very brightly insisted that these tape decks for Orion should be identical to the type tape decks for Atlas, so they were interchangeable. It caused a bit of a pain because, of course, the two teams had to talk to each other about how they interface uh, their tape decks. But these tape decks were uh, interchangeable with the one which tape that you can see. So, big, big money going out now buying in these. Um, and here are all the girls in Ten Bay making the packages. And as a young um, engineer venturing into here to go and talk to one of the people in the offices in the back there, for some reason, was a bit of a nightmare. He wouldn't be used to this one by all these girls. So that's the way the packages were made in Ten Bay. Here's the commissioning floor with some, a lot of the computers on there being commissioned. Mostly modified. I think the gentlemen in white coats are wildly modifying these production machines because we were still developing at that time. On the left hand side are the commissioning offices where the commissioning engineers sat and there were commissioning computers. There was a corridor down the pathway. Then the raised floor with all the row on row. This was the biggest computer production facility in Europe at that time. Um, mighty production line. Then in here is the tape tunnel, which was an enclosed clean area for the tape decks to keep them clean. And then if we go through the tape tunnel, out through the other side, this the tape tunnel, more commissioning floor, there's more machines, and I think mostly the peripherals were commissioned on this side of the peripheral floor. And that is the staircase we got to the Now, here's a line printed being commissioned. And then behind us, from this, from this view, the end of the floor, and We've racked our brains to what these things can be. And I think they must be special test equipment which were built to test individual doors of the machine prior to assembling them into the system. <coughs> must have been a fearfully expensive production production process. This box down here, I believe, is a programmable margins tester, which was a, a, a somewhat fearsome thing that the program in the computer could control this thing to change the voltage margins on the computer that the program was running. Um, there was a sort of watchdog timer which said if everything is going to ground or uh, wrench it back to the office. And the idea of this was that it could pass root and faulty packages automatically with this sort of equipment. A lot of people, a lot of expensive equipment trying to get these dozen machines made. As I said, the Turing's machine was the important one because the customer was jumping up and down and saying, where's my computer? And it wasn't finished. I think at this stage, McTain and Hunt weren't working together properly. But the customer insisted and said, my, said send my machine or else you won't get any money. So the bullet was bitten and the machine, unfinished as it was, was crazy up by these gentlemen in the loading bay, number two bay and all stored up on the wharf ready for the lorry. And this is this box here, so I think it's got two of the computer banks in it. And when you look at this sign here, it's the one that I'll make sure it's beautiful, you know, wonderful, The only thing is no one told the sign writer that active Belagi means limited company. So it actually says Turing's limited company and company. So it's a when they got to school. But all right, can't find any more. And here it is all loaded on the lorry, and in this first box is a hammer printer. I know it's a hammer printer because scrawled up there and scrawled here 
is <laughs> So we were exporting our educational standards. <laughs> anyway, that went down to Sweden in the cold January. And by April, on the front page of the Electronics Weekly, it says, Ryan number one goes into service. And I assume I, uh, it actually wasn't accepted by the tourists. Um, the chain until the man. So I think it was running for, for a month, probably as a sort of test. Um, and uh, so very rapidly, Tom Holton and his team who had got taken this out um, and uh, it managed to get the thing working well enough by the April for it to be using the production line established. And here is your speaker as a young man in front of the console of the new street machine with John Moore looking on the bottom of the street chain. And it looks as though I'm taking a great interest in group charts, so that must have been important at the time. Um, this is the only picture I know of. Uh, I haven't got a picture of an authentic customer's installation. But uh, this is uh, the Rotham State, this is the Rotham State control desk. And so it's the only customer picture, as far as I know. Um, and you can see there the desk. With a telephone, I mean, this is a telephone over here, lots of bits of paper, a tape, a reel of tape in there, and some notes here, and the operators are here, and over here is the room map. And um, I thought you might be interested in what it was like when you were. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that is a genuine Orion room map with some ungenuine electronics. <laughs> um, if only we'd had TTL in those days. Um, and this was the kind of picture you see, these little twinkling lights um, showing where the thing, what, how the thing was operating. And there it was there. Fred Heath gave me that uh, room map about 25 years ago, or 20, about that. And he said, here you are, Chris, you can use it as a coffee table. Mm -hmm. Could you use one of those as a copy? <laughs> uh, he, he told me which machine it came off, but I now have no idea what machine it came off. The big A refers to the tape reader, which would have stood in front of that black bit, tape reader A. Right, um, now reliability. This is a statement or a little printout of the, of the Vickers machine, one of the latest machines, 1967. Uh, note the kind of quality of printing that you've got off a 665 printer. Um, and it's an assessment of the week's results of that week in view. Um, the, the relevant number is this, 96% efficient. That's to say, of the available time to the user, um, about 4% of the time was in repairing and fault finding and so on. Not bad for 1967, but not good either. Um, could do better. Uh, the metal box company, uh, Orion at Worcester, um, is quite interesting. They had their machine for eight and a half years, from 1964 to 1972, and um, in that time, it did nearly 30,000 hours. It was available for nearly 30,000 hours, 94%, good, so a little worse than the Vickers machine. Nevertheless, that was thought satisfactory. And what is most important, and I think a very telling point about the metal box machine, they were confident enough to let their machine, which was running production application work, let it, up, let it for other users, because uh, the Cadbury's and Vickers both came, Cadbury's and someone, both came to Metalbox and used their machine for program development. Now, that is an indication of the confidence they had in the in the environment, program is defended from, you know, all programs are defended from one another. And that was pretty unique. Um, they, nobody else was able to do that. But indeed, uh, Harold Gearing, whose, whose machine that Metabox was, is fond of saying that he went to Poughkeepsie in New York to look at the early IBM 360s, where he was given the spiel about time for time sharing and so on, and uh, we're going to release this. And he said, well, we've had that for two years, what are you talking about? We were well ahead on multi-program at that time, thinking about the neurons. Um, here is 
Here I am prototype in the lab at West Norton. Uh, we've got the, cons the back of the console towards us here, and you can see the bays down there, somewhat congested. Over here is the tape switching unit, and there the tape decks and the entrance that goes across to the bridge, across the other side of the bridge there. And this photograph I took um, illegally on the last day. I couldn't bear to see this computer being switched off and dismantled without a record of it. Uh, so I took that photograph on the, on the day it was switched off, ready to be dismantled. By this time, 1965, we were well into the 1900, 1904 and so on, which were further down the line behind us. Um, and Charlie Portman and Virgilio had spent five years of their productive life struggling with this beast. So no wonder they're looking like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's the console with the still box stuff. I can't remember any special celebration because, of course, we were all on the project this thing. Uh, so that's again the last day of Orion, Orion Hall. <coughs> so, why did it come to an end? Well, it was a profitable machine, one very reliable. It wasn't a profitable machine by the 1960s, very expensive to make for its performance. Um, and that's partly, I mean, mostly, I suppose, down to the technology. Uh, Orion 2 followed it as a sort of rescue mission to rescue customers who were uh, dissatisfied with their Orion models. Orion 2 was identical functionally, used the same operating system on, uh, and the same sets of peripherals and so on. It was just made with a technology different from the new ones. Um, but it's another story. I won't say anything about Orion 2, largely because I know nothing about Orion 2. Uh, at this time, we were talking with the merger with ICT. <laughs> The biggest range of incompatible computers on the market was going to be resolved from that. Very unlikely that Orion could survive through such a situation. And in any case, the rise of the compatible ranges, the 1900 range and the System 360, uh, this, is when, this is when this was happening, when that was happening in 1963-ish. Um, and so here is a photograph of an Orion. Uh, at the time of the merger talks, uh, we've got a console again with the back of a console with panels off, so you can see we've got the console there. And this is Sir Edward Playfair, chairman of ICT, obviously being uh, buttered up at the Ferenti Computing Department, knew what he was talking about. Ray Levitt, one of the developer, uh, commissioning engineers, Jim Hughes with his factor as manager of the commissioning, Arthur Jackson, who was managing the project. The Orion project at that time, and if only we knew where he was. Sid Turner, another commissioning engineer. For years and years, I thought this was Peter Hall as a young man. But I think it may be Basil Ferranti. Am I right? No, it's me. It is you. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Cedric Dickens, who has something to do with public relations in ICT. Is that right? Yes. I think so. Um, so with that, I, it was a heroic, it was a heroic project, one of the extremely few projects, uh, computers that uh, uh, Ferranti designed entirely in Paris. Lots and lots of people, and there are many names I know, I have 